So welcome to supporting physical and virtual environments and hybrid and in-person classes. We're going to start with some introductions and then move on to some kind of basics for the session, explain the whole format and then jump right in. Um, I'll start. I'm Sam Craighead. I'm Associate Director of Professional Learning in the Office of Distance Ed and E-Learning. Hi, I'm Queenie Chow, also from OD. I'm a consultant there. Hi, I'm Andy Vogel. I'm the Classrooms Services Coordinator with OD. All right. Thanks, y'all. So outcomes for today. Um, by the end of the session, we want all of you to be able to list considerations for teaching and learning during a pandemic in courses that have some type of classroom component. Um, plan for ways to communicate with your students about how to adapt and succeed in a course that has multiple modes of instruction. Uh, identify tech tools that can help facilitate in-person hybrid uh, learning. And of course, um, be able to find the resources and assistance uh, that can help you beyond the session as well. Oh, looks like I need to speak louder. I will work on that um, with confidence. So our agenda today, uh, we have kind of four big sections we're gonna go through. We'll start uh, talking about instructional modes, uh, move on into uh, learning environments and tech tools. Uh, we'll come back to talk about communicating with your students that wraps both of those first two things in. And then we'll of course come back to resources at the end. Um, we have uh, designed this to have opportunities for you to interact, whether it's in chat or as part of an activity um, or to provide your questions to us every 10 minutes or so. So um, if you do have questions and you want to save them up for those breaks, we'll have slides that kind of point those out. Um, but you're also welcome to drop those in chat as you go. Um, it, whoever's not presenting, we'll try to help uh, with feeling some of those if we can. Also, always want to call out that if there are other folks here who have answers to those questions, either based on your experience teaching um, or if you're an academic support staff person and you want to help out, please feel free to, to do that. It's the, the, the more um, folks that are, are, are able to help out, the better. So um, please don't hesitate to share uh, responses and answers and solutions if you have those too. All right, so let's start by finding out more about who we have with us today. We're gonna start with a couple bit of uh, poll questions. So our first one is just uh, about your holiday break. So take a couple seconds here. This is a, I think it's either multiple choice or multiple answer, but uh, let us know. During a holiday break, did you eat too much, sleep too much, make every wish come true, or spend all your time planning for classes? And we've got other, of course, as an option. All right, we're about half of people have responded. We're getting close to 100%. Maybe a couple more seconds. All right. And our results looks like eating too much is extremely popular as long as well as uh, other. So I guess we'll look in the chat to find out more about what else people did. Um, I guess good, good or bad, depending on, on how you feel about it, would be that only about a third of us. Uh, we're spending all the time planning for spring 21 classes. So that's hopefully a positive thing for you all. Okay, we got one more question here before we get started. This is a little bit more specific to some of the teaching you've already done during the pandemic. So let's see. So last semester, we just want to know about during fall term, did you teach an in-person course, a hybrid course, an online course? Did you not teach? All right, looks like we got just about everybody there. A lot of folks teaching hybrid courses, so that's good to know. Um, this is a lot more than we would have had back in the, uh, but the last time we did a session like this at the start of fall is so the hybrid teaching thing has been really new to a lot of folks. So we'll get into a little bit more about what that experience was like, um, but thank you for sharing that. That helps us better understand who we're working with today. So thinking back to folks who did just teach last term, if you could in the chat share one thing you want everybody else to know about teaching in spring term, if there's one resource, one tip, one thing not to do, one thing to definitely do. And if you don't have anything, that's fine too. Hopefully we'll be giving you some. Um, I know from our end, uh, if, if we had to narrow down everything we're going to cover today into one place, 
it's to uh, go to the get started page on a keep teaching site. We can drop that link in in a second, but everything that we're going to be covering um, is sort of aligned to the, the recommendations there that connect with additional resources and additional information and also reinforce what we're going to be talking about. So looking at some of your responses. Students are incredibly stressed. Yes. Zoom discussions are hard to do well. Figure out what tools you need and practice. Yeah. Online office hours. This is great. Thanks everybody for sharing these. And, and some of these I think will hopefully align with some of the things we'll talk about today, um, but also hopefully give some ideas to some other folks here who maybe are looking for some supplementary stuff. Um, all right, so we're gonna keep moving. First, we're gonna start with talking a little bit more about modalities. So I know it looks like a number of people have already taught hybrid um, before, which is, is good. It's about half of the folks here. So some of these sort of fall under that category. So I'm gonna tease out some of the differences there. Um, we'll, we'll also talk um, specifically about some in-person distance and distance enhanced stuff. Um, the distance ones being less important probably to today's session because we're, we're really focusing on folks who do have some type of classroom component. But we do also have, you know, all of us, everyone's teaching online for the next two weeks. And I think we'll have to check, but I think finals week might be like that again as well. So we have, regardless of your modality, there's a combination of these that's happening. So we want to just review each of these briefly. Um, I'm going to be pretty, pretty brief on each one. Um, we'll, we'll try to share examples of what that means and then also an example of what a schedule for that looks like. Um, and we'll kind of get into why as we go. So starting here, in-person courses, this is what we're probably all the most used to. It's probably what most of our education has been like. Um, so we don't, I assume I don't need to spend too much time explaining what it means, but um, you know, again, it's entirely in a physical classroom. Um, there's limited or there could be limited, you know, the requirements for technological components are are lower, right? There's not an expectation that you have to use technology in some way if you're meeting in person. Your class could be entirely designed around having discussion in a circle, just depending on the course, right? So, um, but you know, there's, there, so there's, but there's, you know, our spaces have technology in them. So that is now becoming more and more part of the experience. Um, consistent schedule is part of that, right? So students know where to go when they sign up because the schedule was there as part of signing up for the course. So if they have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, they come to the same place on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or they come to the assigned space. And that's sort of part of what sort of is specific about a normal in-person experience. From a registrar standpoint, there is also sort of in the percentages of how the course is set up to, to, to act. So if it's 75 to 100% on campus, that it makes it a, um, you know, by the processes they use, that falls under the category of in-person. Um, we're not going to get too much into splitting hairs on those percentages, but that is sort of, we just want to include that there as well, because you may hear uh, departmental leadership or schedulers um, when they're talking about a course, there might be some, some language around that too. So an example of an in-person course, I've mentioned one similar to this. You meet in person on Monday and Wednesday, you have homework outside of class on the other days of the week. So, you know, there's the, the standard scheduling patterns at the university, this kind of falls within one of those op like options. A distance course, um, also often referred to just as an online course, although this is, again, the terminology used by the university would be a course where everything is happening online. So all instruction occurs at a distance, um, whether that's synchronous or asynchronous. I'll get into a couple examples of what those things mean in a second. Um, but there's no part where they have to come in, right? There's no testing center. They have to come in and take a test. There's It's just 100% from a distance. Um, and then the days of the week are going to be different kind of based on how your course is designed. So for a distance course with asynchronous classes, meaning that there is not any time where students have to be meeting with you um, or as a class together um, collectively, uh, that's an asynchronous course, right? So they could have Carmen learning every day of the week with homework due every day as well. Um, so they would be interacting with content and, and uh, activities that they would learn about through Carmen uh, based on stuff that you've already posted and organized there. Um, and a synchronous course or combination, of course, has a combination of the two. Um, maybe your class meets collectively on Zoom one day a week. So maybe there's a scheduled time where everyone in the class is required to be there or you're posting a recording, whatever that is, there's a synchronous component. And then the rest of the week, they're still participating, but sort of at their own pace and speed while completing assignments and activities on a certain scheduled timeline. 
for a distance enhanced uh, delivered online, but perhaps there's testing that gets done um, somewhere that has to happen in person. There's a practicum or there's field placement or there's something that happens outside of you know a the, the, the rest of the course being primarily online. Um, so it typically is going to not be part of a consistent schedule. So this might mean your whole course is online, but then at the end of the term, you come in for a final in person. Um, or you know, there's a placement that happens at some part of the term. So that schedule is gonna be pretty different. And that's that would fall under the category of distance enhanced. This is again, sort of a term that's gonna be more commonly used from like the scheduling side. Um, so this is like the technical term the university uses for this type of course. Of course, and hybrid. So it sounds like a lot of folks are already familiar here. And this is where a lot of different things fall under the spectrum, um, but sort of from the, um, the official definition here, 25 to 74% of the course is happening on campus. 25 to 74% is happening online, right? There's obviously has to add up to 100%, but um, that's sort of, that's gonna be, there's a whole spectrum of how this could happen where there's both online in-person instruction. It could be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. Um, a percentage of classroom time gets replaced with time that's spent online, um, but the schedule would need to be consistent. And so we'll, we'll talk about how, how do we communicate that. So a couple of this would be, so say everyone in your class meets in person on Monday, it's a synchronous meeting, they all come to the same classroom. And then the rest of the week, they could have asynchronous online work to do. Uh, maybe there's modules they engage with in Carmen, uh, where there's content they engage with, there's activities where they're engaging asynchronously in a discussion board. Um, they do their homework and they do those things asynchronously. Um, or here's a hybrid uh, structure where you could have both in-person and Zoom meetings. So perhaps they're meeting Monday in your classroom. On Wednesday, you're all meeting at the same time, but it's over Zoom. Um, and then the rest of the week, this is sort of the homework schedule. So last three, um, sort of these all fall under the hybrid category, but there's sort of different flavors of that. Um, part of the challenge has been that there's a lot of different um, interpretations uh, or with different ways different universities might refer to certain language. So this first one blended would be a mostly in-person course with technology added that I've seen used in a lot of different ways. So we've, we've tried to keep that relatively vague here. Um, high flex is a term a lot of folks have probably heard over the last year. It's been uh, around for a while, but really popularized during the pandemic. And in a lot of cases, it's actually been kind of used incorrectly. So the real definition of this and what the research is around is in courses that are designed to allow for flexibility for students. It's a hybrid flexible course. Um, so that generally is, means there's a lot more work in designing it, a lot more work in how it has to be facilitated toward the goal of students being able to participate in way, whatever way works the best for them. So it could be that they're showing up in person for everything, could be that they're completing everything online asynchronously on their own kind of schedule, but they're kind of hitting the assignments and due dates um, in the way that you need them to, or it could be that they're synchronous online meetings. Um, where they're meeting at a distance kind of based on, or again, they could also be choosing and flexing on that throughout the term. So that's a pretty complicated one, and we're not going to really focus too much on like a schedule for that because there's so many possible ways it could work, but the goal is complete flexibility for students. And then simulcasting would be this last one, which is what I know a lot of folks have done over the last year. Um, and we'll talk about some of the technology for this. So uh, Andy will cover this most of our classrooms at this point at Ohio State, um, or at least all the ones that are being supported that we're working on do have the technology to make it possible to do this. So we have cameras in place, we have microphones in place, um, but there is also that additional component of how do you facilitate a course in two modes at the same time, right? Because you're teaching in the classroom, but you're also running a live stream and there's students on both places. So to, to engage them all, it often takes a TA or multiple TAs or you know additional support from your from your college. So we just wanted to call out like these the, these other ones are more complicated. Um, and we do have tools and resources there to help with that, but we also just want to like caution people that it, it, it is, a, there's a lot of work in the design process and in the support process that you're like in your course and you level that, that really needs to go into making those successful. So I know that's a lot. So in the chat, I wanted folks to share what their instructional mode is. And I'm going to jump back real briefly to that first slide where I had them all listed. But if you want to share what your instructional mode is for spring, if you know it, Start sharing those and see what we're what we're playing for. Regrettably, high flex. <laughs> oh, 
All right, so we got a pretty good mix. It sounds like we have like a lot of folks that taught hybrid in the fall. Hopefully, for those of you who are teaching hybrid this time, you've had a little bit of experience. But if not, we'll be talking through some of these things with you. All right, so we're going to jump back in. So to go a little bit deeper on these today, but um, different types of modalities, we have a much more robust resources on the Keep Teaching site. Okay, so... Um... My name is Andy again, and I am the classroom coordinator for Odie. I supervise the helpline, so uh, when you call in for classroom support stuff, I'll be the one of the ones, uh, you know, responding and helping out with other technicians. So, without further ado, oops, um, I'm just going to go over it's kind of the types of learning environments. So, I saw a lot of people in the chat. Um, it sounds like. Most folks have taught in both the physical and virtual space. Um, so I won't go into super in depth on what this is, but some of the things you can expect is uh, with classrooms, especially if you taught last semester, you may be in a novel space or a you know, non-traditional classroom space. Um, so that may be in a performance hall. Um, hopefully you're not outdoors this semester. It would be a little cold, but um, we did have some people utilize that. And then obviously if you're virtual, um, you know, you would be utilizing Carmen course and if you taught in last spring, that may have been a new thing for you. Um, and then of course, Zoom as we're doing today um, to connect to people remotes. Okay, so some of the considerations for physical spaces is the technology and layout. So kind of from this visual here, we can kind of see some of the uh, social distancing going on and folks wearing masks. Um, keeping uh, spread apart and with the cleaning of the spaces of uh, facilities will be cleaning every classroom space twice a day. And we also are um, giving out um, PPPE kits to students, staff, and faculty. Uh, it may be a little bit different with your department on how that's administered, um, but they are, it was in eStores, it's now in Workday. So you should be able to get that ordered and um, sent to you or, obtained. And then of course, um, you know, masks, everyone's expected to wear masks in the classroom, students, faculty, and staff. Okay, so we're going to launch another poll here. Um, but this is just going to kind of go over like, you know, what tools you may or may have not used in the uh, past. Okay, and that should be up. Everyone able to see the poll? I'm not seeing a poll on my end. I okay. can see if you like. Is that the third one? There we go. Okay, there it goes. Great. Just a few more moments. Looks like everyone's quickly voting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it and share the results out here. So everyone should be able to see that now. Um, so yeah, not surprising. Most folks have used Carmen Canvas and Zoom um, like we are today. Um, it looks like a few folks have used MediaSite, iPad, document cameras, and OneDrive. So yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so um, some of the tools that you may be using for the hybrid teaching, um, digital as you know, Carmen Canvas looks like everyone has used that in Zoom. Uh, Media site, I'll explain a little bit more about what that is, but it's similar to Zoom, but in a sense of where we're storing our video files. And then collaborative note taking, so like Office 365. Um, Think of Microsoft Word, but online, so folks can communicate in real time and edit documents together. And then, of course, the physical space. Um, so some spaces, uh, because of the social distancing, you may be scheduled in a room or building that you may not have been in before. So the um, technology may look a little different. Um, most folks have probably worked with projectors and that sort of thing, but some spaces may have a different type of display, which may be like a large uh, flat screen TV. 
Um, there may be multiple displays. Fortunately, all of the um, controls are pretty universal to operate those. And then of course, annotating and capturing um, document cameras. So, um, you know, if you taught last fall, um, you may have seen a few of the document cameras out there and, you know, um, have to report that we've put more out there in the classrooms over the break. So those are really helpful and I'll go into more about um, how we can use those for remote and in-person teaching. And then recording and streaming. So again, uh, webcams. So what we're using today kind of to communicate um, using a webcam and microphone. So the classroom's uh, standard is to, at the bare minimum, have a webcam and a microphone in every room. So you will encounter those. There may be different types of cameras and microphones in uh, certain rooms, but at the bare minimum you'll have a webcam and a uh, microphone. And then of course, student devices, um, iPads, iPhones, laptops. So uh, most folks now may have an iPad because of digital flagship, but not quite everyone. So they may have, you know, different devices. Um, so that is something to consider when, you know, um, thinking about using certain softwares or technologies in um, the classroom. Okay, so recording streaming tools. So kind of um, echoing what I said earlier, um, all rooms will be equipped with a camera and microphone and using Zoom will be our method of streaming and recording. So like this meeting today, we're actually recording this meeting. So um, Zoom will have that saved. Either you can choose to save that locally or in the cloud. Um, Either way, you're going to want to back up or save that copy into this program called MediaSite. That's a university supported tool. Um, MediaSite will store that so um, that copy doesn't go away or um, leave after Zoom's retention policy. Um, and you can plug in the MediaSite videos through Carmen. So there's some built in tools with that that we can um, talk about later. And so, last safety. So, this is a big thing here I want to focus on. Um, so if you've been in the general pool classrooms, you may have used some of our handheld mics, our lapel mics, things like that. So we're doing things a little bit differently just to keep up with sanitary uh, practices. So we've took, taken out our handheld mics and we still have our lapel mics, which are like those belt pack mics. It has like a little wire that you could clip onto your collar. Uh, what we've done is we've taken that wire and we've actually removed them to sanitize them and we're loaning them out and we're loading them out from Anderson Classroom Building, room 30. It's in the basement. There is a uh, service desk where you can go and loan a microphone for a semester long loan. Um, and if you need any longer, just let us know, we'll work with you. But um, in short, you know, if you're in a room and you will need some microphone support or help, um, please come by and see us, you know, we're open, you know, it's seven to five, Monday to Friday, and we, have equipment to loan out and help you um, get situation with your room. Okay, so annotation tools. So I'm um, kind of hovering back to the document cameras. So different spaces will have different tools. So this could be whiteboards, blackboards. Some of them may be mobile um, whiteboards. Some spaces did not have some. So, you know, we were working with departments and other groups to try to get a whiteboard and blackboard out to every, um, you know, novel or traditional classroom um, to get that uh, out there for folks. Uh, and then a couple other methods, you know, for um, capturing the data for the remote folks or online class is uh, using your device to either take pictures of what you're writing and uploading into Carmen Canvas or um, using the document camera. So the nice thing about the document cameras is we've connected all the document cameras to the computer. So this means that you can use the document camera to um, stream like from the camera. So for example, if you wanted to show a piece of paper or a book and write on it, you can put that under the document camera and that will stream into Zoom. Um, I'll, I'll go over on how to get some help and maybe some hands-on support with that if that's something you're interested in in a little bit here. And then uh, safety, uh, kind of what I said before, um, they're giving out the sanitary kits uh, to students, faculty, staff. Um, last semester, they were giving them out in Thompson Library, 
in the Ohio Union, and then anyone who was in a dorm, they were, already had them. Um, I believe they just needed their buck ID to access those. And then, uh, of course, um, you, your department can order those for you. Okay, so collaborative activities. Um, so not all students may have the same tech or access to technology. So um, a lot of the things we're gonna be talking about is you know using the university supported tools that we have because all the students will have access to that. And particularly that's the Office 365. Um, part of the reason we like using this is um, not only do they have access to it, but it also allows them to be socially distant if they need to do something to recreate the experience of group work and collaboration, um, you can make a Microsoft Word document. It's gonna look the same, but it's just gonna be online where folks can collaborate in real time. So if you have some folks working remote and some in person, that's a good tool to use. And then, you know, obviously like we wanna promote those type of, of activities to be uh, socially distant. Okay, so a um, few links and resources here. So first one at the top, uh, classroom.osu.edu. That's kind of your one-stop shop for um, all classrooms. So that will have a list and images and the dimensions of classrooms, so socially distanced. So over the summer, we went through and measured all the rooms to lay down stickers and keep folks you know, socially distanced. You can actually see those blueprints or measurements on the website. So there's images of those in addition to just an image of the classroom. And it'll have a list of what available technology are in those rooms. So that's a really helpful um, resource to bookmark. And then this second link here is the request help. So this is where you can actually go to request help or what we like to call is like a technician appointment. So if you know um, which classroom you're teaching in and you have some questions or you just want an overview of it, um, you know, I encourage everyone to just, you know, go through that form and fill that form out and schedule a technician appointment. Um, I will have someone out there to meet you to go through um, the technology to demo. Um, if it's Zoom, if you want to look at the document camera, whatever it is, um, by all means, feel free to fill that out. Um, I have people on campus today. <laughs> so, you know, we are, we're ready to help out. And then this last piece here is our um, kind of one-stop shop phone number. So if you are in a classroom and you do have, you know, it, it happens if the tech goes sideways, um, you can call this number here, the 688-4357 or 688-HELP. Um, this will get you connected to one of our operators. Now, um, if you know, in the past, um, maybe you were in an arts and sciences room, maybe you're in a college of education room and you had to call different numbers and that sort of thing to different support. Well, this kind of takes that out. Um, we have like a back channel with some of our technicians on teams and this will just go straight to that operator and that operator will reach out to me or whomever to, you know, um, get somebody out there. So you won't be transferred or anything like that. So it's a, it's a good resource to have, um, to um, dial up if you have any um, classroom issues or, or concerns. Andy, I think we got a question related to this. Yeah. And I just wanted to make sure we highlight it because I think it's something that I'm really excited about that is maybe a, a silver lining to like all the collaboration we had to do in the pandemic how yeah. uh, IT support groups are now with each other so that even if even if they're not supported by central supported units, like if they contact that number or that form, you guys are working with people in the other areas to help get the yes. right people out to spaces. Yeah, yeah. So like the real scenario is, is like if someone calls in and says, hey, I have someone over in Haggerty that needs help, um, we all get a notification and we'll all look at it. And by all, I mean about 50 other technicians and, you know, very quickly to respond and get somebody out there. And, you know, there's been times where, you know, my groups needed extra help and other, you know, colleges have stepped up and helped us out. And that's been just really wonderful. Um, and it's just like cut down on, you know, um, waiting and, you know, boosted our response time. Does that include like the medical campuses as well then folks in that area? I believe yeah. we have those folks on our teams. Um, 
it may work a little differently, but um, that's something, you know, like at the end, we can definitely verify and I'll just go through and look because um, I'll admit there's a lot of people on there. So. See, Brian has a question about students coming up to write on the board. I don't know that there's a rule against it. I think it's one of those just trying to think through how do you um, come up with a way to, to encourage them to do that safely. So not having multiple students crowding around a board is probably ideal. Um, it's what some of the challenges of before the pandemic, we were really focused on doing all of our workshops in active learning classrooms and focusing on a lot of those activities. And those now in the pandemic are, there's a safety component that you really have to rethink them. But I, I don't know that there's any any um, thing telling you can't do that. I think it's just with any surfaces that you're touching, we always want to try to clean those after your class. And if you're coming into the classroom, you, did, you want to use your PPE kit to clean those too. And there should be kits given out to the faculty that will have markers that they can designate, you know, to themselves or others if they want to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And then Lisa had a question about best alternative for going to the board. So sharing in a dot cam or office. I, I, I go ahead, Andy, if you have an answer there too, it kind of depends on the class. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. It's, it's definitely going to be um, based on the environment that you're in. So um, as we know, there's going to be some rooms that just have better lighting and whiteboards that look better or a certain way on cameras. Um, so it, it's definitely something where, you know, we'd be happy to set up a tech appointment and go troubleshoot or test some things together, um, you know, before class um, and demo the lesson. But yeah, I think, you know, both of those work, uh, Lisa, I, it kind of depends, I guess, on how the students are participating. Um, and, and again, if you have, if you're using the document camera and connecting that through the computer and broadcasting it over Zoom, Students could see it in both locations. Yeah. Um, same thing with Office 365. So it's, you know, if the, if everyone in the class, whether they're in person or participating in a distance has a device where they could look at Office 365, that'd be one way for them to, to see it. So that, that might work. If it's a class where you just wanna be able to share it with everyone widely, document camera probably, probably works better there. And then Holly, I see you had a question about kind of writing on the board from, at least from our understanding with this, it's, there's not, um, you know, it's not something that's being patrolled in a way of like whether people are violating, uh, you know, some of the, the, the space of distancing. We, we do everything to, to have the classrooms designed and set up in a way that keeps seats and people away from each other. So I think this would really be um, I guess on, on you or on the other instructor to think through how do you, um, ask students to come up and share stuff on the board uh, in a safe way. So it's, it's additional planning and additional complexity, but I think that's, it's kind of just, it is sort of on you and managing the class to figure out what's, what's a way that we could share that doesn't involve multiple people or any people having to get close enough to each other that it's, it's presenting a distancing problem. A couple good questions on um, OneDrive. And must they be signed in to do that? Yeah, so they would need to sign in to their name dot number account. There should be a um, like the ship lift that comes up and asks for your name dot number whenever they click on a link, and then they should be able to log in and you should see their initials in the document. I just saw some other comments about document cameras um, from Holly. Yet yeah, there's. Um, I, part of the, the thing that's nice with the document camera is anything you put under it can be projected. Um, so it's even, I'm, some folks have even used it to put like an iPad underneath that camera. Yeah. Like there's lots of different stuff that you can share that way. So yeah, that's, that's certainly an option. I'm trying to run through the rest of these too. And just I, as a callback to earlier um, from when I got kicked off the internet, but my next section that we're getting to does touch back on like, how do we communicate about the different instructional modes? So if there were questions from earlier, we didn't get to apologies for, for, for that technical hiccup, we can, we can bring those back and, and kind of loop them into that next, next chunk. And also at the end of the session too. Travis called out a, uh, an issue with multiple people editing in one drive. Um, 
we've actually run into that too. And so I know from our end, we typically have ended up using Word documents um, that are that are shared in OneDrive and then um, trying to just be clear on how we open those up. But um, yeah, there's, it's, it, if, if you're using online, people should be able to collectively edit at the same time. If someone opens it on the desktop, that's where it starts to get a little bit oh, yeah, um, a different. Point. But it, if it's if you're using OneDrive and you have like a Word file in there or a different file to open, it does default to open in a, at a tab online in like the browser version. And that tends to be a way that people can collaboratively look at things without it being as much of an issue, at least from what we've seen and experienced so far. Terry's method of using two webcams and sharing those. Yeah, so that, like a makeshift document camera, I see what you're doing, yeah. That's it. That works. Yes. <laughs> I'm always glad to see her in any of these sessions. She's got all great, all kinds of great tips and experience. So I think Andy, did you have anything else you want to add before we, we jump forward to the next section? Um, you know, we'll all hang out a little bit after the session. So if anyone has any specific questions or, you know, anything regarding just classroom or getting help, you know, uh, feel free um, to give me a shout and, you know, um, we'll send our emails out and things like that. Cause I, I saw there was a few med center questions that I'm going to follow up with on my supervisor and we can talk about that. Cool. So we'll keep this moving. And again, we'll have plenty of time for questions. We're doing uh, well on time with our schedule. So um, jumping into communicating with your students. Um, Real quick, I'm going to move my chat window down so I can see everything. Okay, uh, so everything that's listed out here is is from what you'll find on that Keep Teaching Get Help page. These is this is sort of the series of items that we think are just relevant to everybody right now. Um, and I'm not going to dive into all of these in detail. Oops, sorry. Like in particular, like Carmen Canvas. Um, like we have other sessions and recorded sessions on that. There's resources. Um, there's short video resources on the site. That, that dig into this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some tips to build connection and about how and, and what types of considerations we have for communicating our instructional mode and schedule to people. So the, the real, the key recommendation that we're focusing on here is really in your syllabus. So when you update your syllabus and, and, and upload it to Carmen and share it with students, making sure that um, that you're covering these types of things, right? So the, the, as, we were, as I was talking about earlier, um, many of us or most of us are gonna be, you know, at least, at least pre-pandemic are very used to in-person instruction. And so we now have this whole spectrum of different hybrid um, classes that we're, that we're teaching or learning in. Um, from the, the poll earlier, I know most folks here, it's, or it looked like are teaching hybrid um, or at least half of you taught hybrid last term or some version of that. And there's so many different versions, right? And so many different definitions. So thinking through how to explain that to your students and how to clearly um, lay it out there, um, you know, it's no longer a place of, I know where my classroom is. I know what days we meet. I know how to get there and when. Um, it's now, okay, what place am I learning? Is it online? Is it in person? What days is it? Do I have to be there? Is it a synchronous thing? Like there's so many different elements there, right? So we really wanted to start start by focusing on making sure you understand and and and, and have a good grasp on what your instructional mode is um, and then communicate that to your students. So thinking about how they will participate, diagramming out not only what days you meet and where you meet, but um, what days they might be doing homework or what sections are, this is an amount of time you wanna be focusing on, um, you know, looking through stuff in Carmen, stuff like it's. I know it's gonna vary, you know, class to class. Um, but then yeah, getting into that daily and weekly schedule. So how do we make sure that it's clear um, both on a daily and weekly level and over the course of the term, uh, when they're participating, where they're participating, when things are due, right? It's, these are all things that would already be part of a syllabus, but now you just kind of have to flesh that out a little bit more to be a lot more clear. Um, but we also have to consider here, and, and I think we're all aware of, um, for the next two weeks, our classes are all online, regardless of how you're scheduled, right? But regardless of what the mode is that the rest of your class takes place in, you have an online course for the, for the next two weeks. Um, and I believe, I don't have to go check, I think we're doing finals again that way. And then of course, if there's um, issues uh, due to COVID, they could force folks back to fully online again, right? It doesn't seem likely at this point, but um, right. So we have to be thinking about 
How do we make sure that that's updated and that's clear? So not only how are we going to communicate, where do you show up throughout the term, but where do you show up the first day of class? Where do you go the first two weeks of class? Um, you know, finals is something we can get to closer to finals, but yeah, thinking through all that and making sure it's clear for students. And then also just making sure it's clear what those communication channels are. Uh, you know, in the past, it may have been come to class. You can ask me questions before class, during class, after class, here's my office hours. Here's when you can meet me in person, right? There's, we now have to think through that differently. So if you have, if you're doing some type of physical office hours that involve distancing, um, or you're doing Zoom office hours, or you're just having certain times, you're saying, I'll be available to respond to email. Like the more detail you can put in there and be specific for your students and consistent, the better that's going to be to make sure that they understand, okay, this course is different. Or, you know, at this point, a lot of them are going to be familiar with what fall was like or what last spring was like. Um, but again, your course is new and, and different to them too. So just being clear about that and making sure they know where to go for questions. You could also be considering are there ways that um, they can help each other answer those questions? So if you have space in your Carmen carved out for like discussion boards, um, or if you're leveraging some other type of system where students could interact with each other, um, that can also be something you could detail out, uh, you know, both in your syllabus and in your classes when you're explaining it to say, hey, I'm only gonna be able to respond to you on these days during these times, but if you have a question, you're welcome to you know, reply to the group or something like that too. So there's, there's a lot, whatever is going to work for you in your class, just the, the need to be specific and detailed here. I just, I, I've said it a lot, I realize, but I can't hammer it home enough. So a few tips for building connection. And again, we'll keep these relatively brief here, but there are more, more robust resources on the Keep Teaching site. Um, so a lot of these are actually tips uh, that are coming from uh, best practices for teaching online. Uh, and because regardless of our, our, our mode this term, everyone has some component of online, um, th there are things that would apply anywhere, right? So finding ways to build an inclusive learning environment and build connection with your students, uh, with you and with each other is gonna be important, especially as they're now trying to navigate all the different locations that class is happening, all the different ways that class is happening. So considering using some icebreakers in the next couple of weeks to help them get to know each other and to get to know things like your course themes and policies, finding ways to tie those things into making sure that they're reading that stuff on the syllabus and highlighting it. Um, you know, find some, building in some, some basic activities for that can be super helpful. Uh, and there's on the Keep Teaching site, there are some, some specific details to build that out more to help you think through those activities. Also establishing instructor presence. So this is another, um, you know, standard of teaching online, but finding ways to introduce yourself. Um, normally you would be, even if your class is in person, these next two weeks, you don't get that opportunity of starting your class off by seeing your students face to face, having them get to, get to know you that way. So, you know, don't don't lag behind getting that started when your class is already going. Um, with your online course, you can go ahead and introduce yourself virtually. Um, if you feel comfortable creating a video of really any quality, I think students can will respond well to that. Just finding some way to, um, you know, show yourself as a person uh, to to whatever extent you feel comfortable. Um, you could do it with a, just a picture of yourself and a brief bio that you type out, including these things in Carmen and putting it in place students can find and come back to. Um, it's just a great way to establish yourself as an instructor in a space that you don't get to physically exist in. Um, and, and really, you know, you can be doing really low quality uh, videos here and still, you know, there's your students are very much used to seeing stuff that people recorded on their cell phone. It's right. It's all over social media. It's all over different places too. So having that be a way, if you are comfortable with that to, to create something just to, to show people who you are and, and why you care about this course and the topics in the course is a really great way to, to connect with them. And then of course, this is all kind of going towards that end of creating inclusive, inclusive learning environments. Um, so a lot, a lot of additional resources on that keep teaching site that go into more detail on these that you can spend some time on. Um, but next wanted to, give you a little bit of time to specifically think about um, how this applies to your own course. So we're gonna have plenty of time for questions. Um, again, these are some of the resource links I was just talking about. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions, both about communicating, we can get back into modes, we can get back into classrooms, um, but we do have another worksheet and we'll, we're not going into breakout rooms so we can make sure we troubleshoot this one with you and you're all able to access it. Um, but we created this worksheet for folks to um, start thinking through their own instructional mode, schedule, and just some basic questions to, to ask for how, how you think through what you're gonna share with your students and how you update your syllabus. 
So I'm, we can go ahead and ooh, paste that in the chat. And just take a few minutes to, to, to download that or tell us if you're having trouble downloading that and start, start answering your questions there and make notes of ones that you have for us. And respond in the chat or I do have for those who have their camera on I can kind of see well that's one person <laughs> um, if if you are having uh, trouble accessing this worksheet let us know and we'll get to work on that looks like people are getting it still didn't have access they may need a screen share it yeah let's go ahead I'll yeah. do I'll do a screen share of the actual worksheet and then we'll make sure we find some way to get this to everybody uh, which we can also, based on attendance, just send an email out to people afterwards just to make sure you get it. One second, let me change my screen share. While this is up, I'm going to see if we can easily just download the file and drop it as a file into the chat too for folks. Apologies that y'all end up having to deal with all of the technical difficulties in one session. All right. Just one second, I do have the file and I'm gonna, oh, Queenie got it first. <laughs> All right, so I guess this next question can be tough for those who weren't able to get it up to the uh, to their computer. But for those who are pulling this up and starting to look through these questions, feel free to start adding any questions that you have for us in the chat. Sorry there. All right, so we now have shared the worksheet in the chat as a file. Hopefully you can download that there. We will make sure to follow up with everybody here and send this after the fact. Um, but as you're working through that, we're, we're getting close to the end here. So this is, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do actually, since we've had a couple problems with this is I'm just gonna go to our last kind of wrap up slides and we can, we can maybe just jump into more general Q and A about communicating with students and instructional modes, if folks are comfortable with that. All right, so just recapping from what we've covered today, and I th hopefully this can inform the, qu the additional questions you'll have for us um, and just kind of tie these things together. The, the real, the, this last one, of course, is where we started from. We wanna keep pointing you back to is that keep teaching, get started page. 
everything that we covered today, um, minus the technical difficulties, because it's a website instead of us trying to navigate multiple people in Zoom, um, all, all that information is there. And, and there's and links off to more robust information where you want that or need that. Um, so more information about instructional modes and how you plan for those different types of, of courses, um, more information about how to develop an icebreaker assignment. Um, but the real takeaways for today that we want you to leave with are knowing your instructional mode, knowing what the schedule is in the classroom and where you can go get support for all of those things. And then once you know those and are comfortable with those, to be communicating um, with your students uh, consistently in your syllabus, consistently in any other language. You, you really can't tell them this stuff enough. Um, and you know, knowing that we have the possibility for more changes throughout the term um, just making sure that you are clear with them on that up front and, and clear with them on what those channels they need to be following are. Um, as with all of this, the, the entirety of the Keep Teaching site has a ton of additional resources that can, that can get into each, in any of these things in more detail. 